Aloha, happy Aloha Friday. It's Kaui Lucas. I am host of Hawaii is my mainland every Friday here at Think Tech Hawaii. And today I'm so excited. I have been wanting to do this show for six months, ever since I first saw this project um, in the at the Capitol, there were posters of it, and I said, oh my gosh, who is this brilliant student? And here he is, Joseph Valenti, <laughs> <laughs> along with his mentor and one of my um, uh, uh, just inspirations for all things sustainable, Matthew Lynch, who is the system coordinator Sustainability System Coordinator. I'm not getting it right. Matthew, what <laughs> that's is close. That's close. That's a System Sustainability Coordinator. System Sustainability Coordinator uh, for UH, system-wide. So all 10 campuses? Correct. All right. So these two have an amazing project um, to talk about. So I'm going to let them talk about it. Um, this um, project here, this thing that we see here, is a what? Well, to start, it's built out of Albizia almost entirely, and it is a small-scale, low-cost housing slash shelter for um, potentially housing our, um, I guess you could say, houselessness community. Houseless community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this was it was so inspiring to see all the different aspects um, of this project that were that they had up at the Capitol um, this um, especially because earlier in the session um, I, I have a picture of it there <laughs> they were showing us these these pods um, made out of uh, plywood in the rotunda that were supposed to be uh, a, a model of sustainable transitional homes and when I saw this I just wanted to cry they wanted two thousand dollars in donation for these and and we will get a, a picture of it up eventually it's the the uh, transitional housing for the homeless uh, yeah the pods oh no this is this is this is the beautiful thing <laughs> oh okay so the one 53.1 um, there we go. Oh my gosh. Look at that. They wanted $2,000 uh, a pop for these as a solution to homelessness. And I was so horrified, as you can imagine. This has got um, a, a little drawer and a little mailbox. But um, so the houseless population is supposed to feel safe and welcome here. Um, so when I saw your project, <laughs> Joseph, I thought, oh, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> somebody's thinking. Somebody's thinking holistically. Mm -hmm. Somebody's thinking about solving multiple problems at one time. So you won an award, uh, Matthew. Can you talk about the award? Sure. So um, Joey was one of the um, first award winners for the inaugural UH President's Green Initiative Awards, and the category that he. Uh, one was in the Green Project Implementation Award. So this is a program that we've set up to help uh, empower our students and to help unleash their creativity, really. So we partnered up with some private sector partners. Johnson Controls actually provided the funding um, for this particular award, it's $10,000 in cash, to support the implementation of either campus-based or community-based projects that would have measurable impacts um, and results that we could measure um, with a time frame on it. So uh, mm -hmm. we announced these at the spring, well, the fourth annual Hawaii Sustainability and Higher Education Summit earlier this spring. Um, and next spring, 2017, Joey will be presenting out uh, the uh, results Ooh. of this. So okay, the, the clock hope is, is ticking. The hope is to build a prototype at scale uh, which uh, $10,000, quite frankly, is not a lot of money to do this. So I've been really impressed with the way that uh, Joey's been able to work collaboratively across the campuses and with the UH Manoa School of Architecture program um, that's provided some really key support and matching funding um, mm. to support a paid position 
Um, so we've already been able to double that money and we're working on leveraging it even further so that we can get this prototype built and, and really learn about all the technical pieces of what it actually takes mm -hmm. um, to convert something that is a problem and that we have an excess of and turn it into something that's useful. So one of the things I, I love about it is that the Albizia wood that you were actually you are actually working with came from another campus of uh, UH Manoa, Correct. right? The Lion Arborium, right? Arborium, yeah. And so tell just just take us in and tell us how how this all came together and where you are. Okay, well let me start um, start back to in my research uh, last fall. And it started with uh, really an investigation of what um, our community here is dealing with in terms of the urban environment, um, some of the most critical issues we have um, today and in our foreseeable future. And undoubtedly, you know, number one is a housing crisis. And, but I think there's more that embodies that. Um, given that we are an isolated, um, vulnerable island community, um, yeah. climate change, you can look at you know, various aspects that we can begin to design as a way of responding to these issues. So that was the first step. And then um, in the middle of all that, it was really an effort to look more deeply into what we have here in abundance and really try to, um, I guess, extract something that was not yet discovered. So, so that was a big step in trying to combine um, a way of resolving these issues and also bringing a more sustainable um, approach to responding to that. So what, what that led to, and you know, I have to give credit to my committee chair, Judith Stogenbauer, because in that transitional phase of understanding really what I was after, she had noted to me that the Lion Arboretum at the time was doing a removal project. And that project was specifically a large sum of Albizia trees. And from my understanding, they had no use for it. It was just all going to get dumped. And these are mammoth trees. I mean, Albizias are, are horrible. They mm -hmm. um, can undermine, um, uh, be quickly toppled by, by wind. And they had that problem uh, with the storm in Puna last year. Some people bra blame the dams busting on the, the root structure. It's an invasive tree that grows incredibly rapidly, 20 feet the first year. Yeah. Wow, okay, so we need to get rid of those. And, um, and so there's an abundance of it. Mm -hmm. And, but this isn't just about, I mean, there's, a, there's so much to it and we have so little time. It's kind of hard to, to, to get into the beauty of this design. So I'm gonna um, ask that we look at the, the the 53.3 site picture and um, have you kind of articulate um, all these these factors of, of what's been happening in our community and how you put them together here. Would you like to talk about them? Sure. So that is a simple site modification um, rendering, basically showing that um, that is these units here as you see in this model and then um, in that whole picture you're looking at is basically um, lightly integrating these into a site. So you have uh, the pods as you could call them, the units, and then the site um, modifications are basically you know lightly implemented into, the, into a site. So you're looking at a you know a very um, easily adapted to a site type design and you're also looking at something that's very um, holistic in terms of the community that it creates. So you're not just, um, you're, you've got a plan that um, talk, talks about um, the interactive uh, features of this into actually a community. Um, which I thought, uh, I don't know what the design uh, parameters were for this project, but I thought that it was really uh, good to, it was very heartening to hear that that discussion was happening. Right, so the, the parameters, are, you know, essentially I created the site parameters. Ah, and, and I based that on um, implementing these and, you know, obviously we have, you know, a big issue with limited space here, especially in our urban context. And the site was selected based on 
you know, investigation of underutilized spaces in our community. And what I specified it to that point was a site, um, actually UH property, and it was an abandoned parking lot over in um, uh, Kalihi, Kapalama. Ah, oh, we have a little short video of that. I didn't realize that it was UH property. Aha, mm -hmm. uh -huh, even better. So um, here we go. Tell us, okay, so this is at the end of Kokea Street. Yes. And it's an empty parking lot. And, you know, I made multiple trips down there during my research, and every time I've never seen a single car in that parking lot. So, you know, given that it's on the water, and obviously it's very um, empty, as you can see, uh, the context with that was also tied to um, the TOD plans and how this site is also in proximity to transportation. So when you're thinking ahead as this, our community develops, you can look at these types of things where you're not necessarily needing parking, but rather than having that parking, you could have housing. And that was, I think, a, a twist on all of that. So. You won the award, you got some money, mm -hmm. and they said, okay, now make it real. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's where we are now. So I got to go visit you in your, um, your workshop at UH, and um, it was so great to see that um, UH Manoa has in their School of Architecture actual fabrication. Mm -hmm. So it's not just theoretical. I mean, a lot of times people here, you know, say things about the ivory tower, but hey, we're, we're doing it. Yeah. And um, there's, a, there's a slide of you, 53-4 um, uh, processing. Um, the, it was just the model, but um, there's some, uh, this is how the model came to be. And it shows the, that tree there. And some of the other important fe features. Do you want to talk about those? Sure. So, you know, the whole process of this is really broken down in that, that image there. So you have, starting from the top left, um, that was actually at the Lion Arboretum during that removal project. And that next image is the log that they donated to me. And from there, we, you know, we milled on site. And luckily, I had support from them to train me how to use a chainsaw and the rig to make that whole thing come <laughs> down to those um, individual boards. And then... In the research, it was really um, taking that, you know, they call it, they would call it essentially a weak material or unstructural, a non-structural material, and turning it into something that's actually buildable. So when you get down into the second row of images, it's, it's breaking down the process of milling the boards into panels and gluing them up as um, a cross-laminated system of um, wood panels where you can then use digital fabrication to basically cut out the kit of parts for this, this structure. Excellent. Okay, well, we're going to take a short break and then come back and learn more about this amazing house. Hi, my name is Justini Spiritu. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson. Every Thursday at 4 p.m., we host the Hawaii Food and Farmers Series. This is the place you can come to for insight on the perspective and history and passions of Hawaii's farmers and all folks involved in Hawaii's local food system. What kind of folks do we have on? So we have everyone from local farmers, we have foodies, chefs, we also have journalists, uh, researchers, anyone who's actually working to help make Hawaii's local food system that much better. So join us every Thursday and uh, tweet into us and ask us some questions and leave your comments as well. Thank you. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kawi Lucas and with me here today is Matthew Lynch, UH's system sustainability coordinator. No, I got it wrong again. But no, you got it right. Forget, mm -hmm. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> and um, one of the rising stars in the uh, world of sustainable architecture at UH, part of their doctorate degree program, um, Joey Valenti, who it has fabricated this beautiful model that's here in the studio out of the nasty Albizia tree. 
and uh, is now making a full size um, prototype. 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 So we have a couple of pictures of you um, down in the studio, but I'd, I'd like to um, just hear how far along you are, what kind of challenges have you had, how are you dealing with them? Oh, look at that smile. <laughs> <laughs> no challenges. No, it's, it's as easy as building this first model. <laughs> no, it's, it's uh, you know, it's a big task to be taken on. I, every now and then I wonder what, what am I doing, you know? What, what am I really taking on here? And, but at the, on the other side of it, you know, I'm very excited about what this could potentially become. So, um, that's my motivation. And I think from graduation in the spring until now, there's been a lot of, um, coordinating, making ends meet, um, sourcing funding, um, getting other departments involved within the within the university system and even beyond that into the community. Um, finding a sawmill team, Laminola Wood, who has graciously jumped on board for this and they're really gonna help make this come to life. So you need a lot of, you know, ends to come together and I think that was the big challenge and what's gotten me to here to where we are now. And, you know, testing with the engineering department was a huge step to see if this is even so I'm sure that people who are in the construction um, business and are looking at this going, yeah, right, Albizia, uh huh? I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, how how have the how's the strength testing um, come along? Well, yeah, as you said, you know, pretty much every other person I meet has that response that there's no way that this is going to come to life, you know. And yeah, it takes you down a notch, and then and then you realize, wait, yeah, this is. This is going to happen. You know, I convinced myself at least that this is going to happen. And the test results in the engineering for the first phase uh, were, I would say, a success. And really the weakness in, in what we found was the joint system that we developed. Since these are such long members, we're developing a joint where you can connect pieces to make them um, come together. Connect pieces in these in these long members, or mm -hmm. um, particularly the longer members. So, so nothing is actually going to be built as one solid piece, but broken up into a few and then um, jointed together. So, so, are these these are all laminated beams, mm -hmm. but they're also not long pieces. Mm -hmm. So, so I've been working to standardize it to a four by eight panel which is the size of the CNC we have in. Um, the size of the what? The CNC machine, which is uh, the digital fabrication, which is the, the machine that's basically digitally cutting out these these cool curves and stuff. Uh, okay, that was that, that um, big machine mm -hmm. with the with hose on it in, in the yep. workshop. Yeah, very oh. cool. Um, okay, so it sounds like, um, how far are you, actually? Um, I, I feel like we're at a pretty good place with the project. Um, we're still at the, the target to have this thing built for the 2017 Sustainability Summit, which is March? March next year. Next year. So not too far out, but we're pushing. 180 days or so, but who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> so Matthew, I have to think that you have been working a bit to b help bring in some of these um, partners and um, where, where is it actually going to be built or is it being built now? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess to, to your first point, um, Joey's really the one that's doing all of the heavy lifting. So um, uh, mm -hmm. and what we're finding is that uh, just in general with our approach to students, um, there is so much latent <laughs> creativity um, and this burning uh, desire to try to solve some of these essential and complex questions of sustainability, that it's literally, let's set up, create some resources, set them up and let them rip. Um, so um, I might have been able to make a few key introductions along the way, um, able to get the initial funding um, with the support of the president's office to be able to launch the program in the first place. Um, but with, uh, imagine this, with a, a small $10,000 investment, right, that's done in partnership with private sector and the university, we've been able to create resources 
that have stimulated this type of creativity. So the other Green Project Implementation Award um, that was given away uh, is a full-scale pilot vermicomposting unit at Leeward Community College where their STEM club is actually building a vermicomposting reactor that is diverting their food waste um, on campus. And then that's now uh, the intent is to then become a nutrient input for their on-campus farm. So, you know, I, I don't come up with these ideas. These are all student ideas. All we're doing is providing the resources and setting them up and then providing support. Well, I hope you give me the name and number of whoever's doing that because you know after our trip to Cuba and seeing those composting, amazing vermicast composting yeah. things, I got to see that. I just got to see that. I'd be happy to introduce <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, but uh, so Joey has, um, is, is learning firsthand how complex it is. You may not imagine how much work goes into building this scale prototype um, and the lesson that you learned before we're getting to the full scale uh, the next size up, what's the scale that you're currently um, is? The new one is double the scale, so it's about twice the height, twice the width, twice the size all around. Which also is ironically perfect size for his cap to fit in, so yeah. do a little bit of smaller <laughs> scale structural <laughs> testing. The, the cap, when I, when I built this, it was, I had a kitten, so he fit in it quite well, and then he outgrew it and was breaking it when he was trying to go in it. So now I have a new one that if I bring it to him, he will probably be all over it. <laughs> Okay, but at, at some point we're gonna get a human-sized one, or yeah. are we moving to dogs? Or no, we're gonna. I would love them. We have a bouncer. Yeah, bouncer would love it. Yeah, I actually have had people say I should make these into dog houses, but I think let's let's get straight from the, the cat house to the full-scale human. Right, because we we definitely have a dire need for them, and after that pathetic uh, slide that I showed you, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. really. You know what's and interesting too is the complexity. The elegance of this com design, the underlying structure is quite, it's quite complex to build a structural beam that has this curve and spans that length. It's not like you can go to Home Depot, buy a few two by fours, slap them together and you're good to go. Um, so not only does this sort of innovative modern design um, that has a sort of passive um, cooling uh, features built into it, um, uh, you know, it's also just a really elegant. I mean, I'd be interested to, you know, try to live in one of these for an experience to see how it is. So it's, it's putting the dignity back into it. But what's also fascinating is that by solving for the complexities in this design, we're actually, Joey is, is pushing the envelope. It's like Tesla when Musk came out, right? The first electric car, he didn't build the affordable electric Pinto for everybody. He built the big sexy beast. That's what this is what this is. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and from there, because you build up at that high performance there, then the lessons that you learn because you're pushing yourself, you're pushing the design envelope, you can scale those lessons back to simpler designs. And that's one of the one of the most ex or one of the more exciting aspects about this. I'm actually more excited about the implications for its potential to generate economic um, cash flows that can support the end goal of ecological restoration. Because what happens after we remove these LPs is what happens if we can create uh, a local a local industry where we can produce uh, low cost, affordable, local building materials that we can use to build our, our in, in our construction, right? Now we've got cash flows that can actually fund LPs of removal. So let's not stop there. Once you remove it, what are you going to replace it with, right? So there's many scales of complexity and intrigue in this project. And um, the only way that you're really going to uh, fully understand what those implications of those interconnectivities are is by actually going out and building something at mm -hmm. scale. So one of the design, uh, so th let's talk about, it doesn't have windows. I mean, people are probably looking at that going, well, where are the windows? Well, there aren't windows. It has one window. Oh, This sorry. big one here. Inside. Which, which I actually designed it as a screen. A screen. And then this doesn't quite show, but I think in one of the images you put up, this would be a ve uh, living wall, so a vegetated. And then natural light would essentially enter the space from that side. Um, but yeah, like you're saying, there are no windows and there are no traditional doors, and that was 
um, intentional. It was really looking at eliminating those types of imported materials because you need there's no local industry for glass or steel. Or, so if you can basically fabricate something like this, it's almost entirely made out of local Albizia. So the, the um, energy needs um, are, what are you thinking? How did you design that? To... Energy, water, electricity... To supply this. Okay, so um, my doctorate project took this on not as just a single unit, but as a community. And the site that we, sh we looked at earlier was, I think, 30-odd units. Um, and I call those the pods. And then I actually looked at a biomimetic um, approach to design for the site. So we took the pods of the Albizia tree and then broke that down in analysis of the pods or the units. And then that supply is fed by the stem, which leads to the tree, which the tree I considered oh. the infrastructural tree or core. That would be um, the communal facilities that would house each of these units. So the communal facilities, we have about a minute left. Um, uh, so there would be the, um, these are the living spaces, but there would be community kitchen food, right. food prep preparation, mm -hmm. and then um, hygiene. Exactly. Uh, would also be communal. Correct. Okay. So in many ways, this is breaking with tradition. Mm -hmm. And um, why not? Because we see where tradition has led us. <laughs> no time to, to expand our horizons a little bit. Um, uh, when do you, or the, the model that you need to have by March, um, how big is that one going to be? That's full size. Full size. And how big is full size? Square footage wise, uh, the Floria area would make up from you know end to end, side to side, about 400 square feet. 400 square feet. Yeah. And there's an upper level loft, which doesn't show in the model, but so it's a two story type space. So. Well, thank you both. I'm so excited about this. Um, keep on keeping on and um, come back and, and show us when it's all built. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. A lot.